Tano, <laughs> my God, you are so much taller in person. <laughs> oh, I love How you. How are you, buddy? <laughs> How you doing? I'm good, man. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Good this is here. great. Yeah. I'm assuming that you've got three great passions in your life. One, obviously, is your music. Second passion is what we're talking about now, the social activism that you're involved with. And the third one, of course, would be your family. I'm interested with those three passions. Do they intersect? Do they inform one another? Do they sort of bleed into, into each other? Hmm. They're, they are the same. I mean, I'm kind of in a family of activists, is the truth. I mean, I was coming to meet the Prime Minister and he's been saying I'm a feminist. So I called my daughter and said, can I say I'm a feminist? <laughs> and she said, you need work to do. She's like, serious. Jordan is her name. And it's like, watch out. And she actually said an amazing thing to me. She said, gender equality doesn't exist anywhere, Dad. Not in Canada, not in America, not in Ireland, nowhere. And it's when you hear her say that, and she says, no, it's true, with women, it's difficult. For, uh, and women have things, that, obstacles to negotiate everywhere. And I'm like, that is, that is true. And, and I've realized that, you know, sexism, I suppose, is, is a, a, being established over thousands of years. It's going to take, you know, it's going to take a lot to unseat it. And, you know, not just political atti you know, attitudes, but even my own attitudes. So I'm learning from my family. Ali uh, is, is, is fighting for justice uh, through commerce. She's a fashion label called Eden. I have a daughter called uh, Eve, who's a, a brilliant actor. Watch her. Watch out. Um, so, I mean, Pain in the Arse runs in our family. I've got two boys that went, we, we went, um, we went to, to the refugee camps over, over Easter. They wanted to come. And they, you know, helping out. You know, it's, it's in our family. And by the way, it makes it better for our family. Because if I'm away, they know why I'm away. And, 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 and by the way, when I'm at home, I really am at home. More than a lot of my friends in Ireland and Dublin where we live who have to leave early in the morning, come home late at night to, to earn a crust. I am when I'm home, I'm really at home. But it's, it helps when I go away for everyone to understand and for everyone to buy into what we're all doing as a family, not just me. You know, what Justin Trudeau has been saying is that Canada is back when it comes to the global conversation. Are you seeing that? You know, it does seem that Canada has a very unique position in the international community right now. A position that's perhaps more valuable than any time in its history. Now that's partially because uh, at the moment, following, I guess, globalization, you've had this phenomenon of localization. Uh, people forgetting about their international obligations, people suspicious of multilateral organizations. Canada has always been um, multilateral in its thinking. It's always thought laterally and communally, a, a community of nations. And I was reading uh, uh, Lester Pearson, writing during the Blitz in London about this destruction that he was witnessing around them, what, what, what just could not continue, and how, how Canada would have to pledge itself to making sure it didn't happen again. It was, so the seeds were there, the D, that's in the very DNA, I think, of Canadian people. I couldn't believe uh, Minister McCallum talking about the refugee crisis, saying Canadians are actually saying to him, look, we give us more. Can you, you know, uh, assimilate more refugees? Properly assimilate, I will say. More, more, you know, he, there, was, there were more, more, more demands in Canada. And I just thought, where does that happen in the world? I don't, I'm not sure you Canadians really understand how you are seen in the world. And, and particularly now, when, when you have this kind of political mayhem across the world with Brexit and whatever's happening south of the border, my God. <laughs> you don't even want to go no, there. No, I don't want to go there. <laughs> Who I wants don't, to go to, I don't go to America? <laughs> I mightn't after that. <laughs> you know, you've spent so much of your time dealing with the rich and powerful, uh, dealing with billionaires, dealing with presidents and potentates and so on. Have you developed over that time, when it comes to fundraising... A bit of potentatinism myself. 
<laughs> I'm, well, There's a bit of potentate in all of us. All of us, yes, yes, exactly. Some of us hide it better than others. Yes. Uh, but have you been able to, when you eyeball a leader, are you, have, have you developed that sense yet whether he's or she is going to come through for you? Because they're all going to say yes to you. But have you developed sort of an inner sense when you look at these guys mm. and sort of say, who are you? Well, sometimes you can get it wrong. Um, I have to accept that. I haven't had that feeling yet. With, with, with uh, the Prime Minister, um, well, I think that the shock for myself and people in the one campaign, you know, we have 200,000 activists here in Canada. And they're like saying, our Prime Minister should go with an activist. Because, you know, normally I'm on the phone calling, you know, leaders ahead of these things. He's been on the phone before me. And so that's different. He is, I can definitely tell you this, he is the most aggressive host we've ever had of a replenishment for the Global Fund. I want to talk for a second about, about Africa and about, you know, what has been a, a huge passion for you. And the problem in the public conversation, when you deal with Africa, people conjure up an image, they say, corruption. It's a black hole. You're putting money, it goes into the pockets of dictators and, and uh, uh, other assorted creeps uh, in Africa. The culture, which tends to be anti-woman in, in many, many countries and so on. How do you deal with that? We have to accept that corruption is killing more kids than, than any disease, including TB, AIDS, or malaria. It's really the truth. And in one, we have fought uh, against corruption with a transparency agenda. You know, there is a vaccine uh, for corruption. Uh, we call it transparency and, you know, open government. You've said in the past uh, that poverty is uh, anti-woman. Anti poverty is sexist. Sexist, That's I think, friend. is, is the line writer. that you use. I, that's an interesting concept. Why is it sexist? The facts really are obvious. There's some shocking ones. Um, I think of maternal health. One in 50 women in the poor world, in the developing countries, dies in childbirth. One in 5,000 here. I think that speaks for itself. How about this on AIDS, because we're at a global replenishment conference. The number one cause of death for women in their prime, in the world, the whole world, is HIV AIDS. Not cancer, not, you know, any of the obvious AIDS. Women are carrying it. What was that moment when you finally said, yeah, I'm an Irish rocker, but I'm also now fully engaged in this topic? Was there one moment that led you to this? Well, it's funny because you and I have been speaking about our experiences in Ethiopia, which we share because you're one of the first reporters in, I think maybe one of the first two, into Ethiopia in the famine in, in 1984. And those pictures, I think you brought to 60 minutes, were pictures that the world had, had not witnessed. Maybe in Biafra in the 70s we'd seen those emaciated kids. But there was something, there was something transformative uh, happened then. We just got angry. We got mad. The world got mad. And musicians are good at turning up to 11. Do you know what I mean? And it was an Irishman, uh, Bob Geldof, got organized. And we raised money um, to fight that famine. And my life as an activist probably began there. The world is really seeing the refugee problem through the eyes of Syria and Libya and of course what's happening in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much bigger than that. Mm. As we know, it seems like humanity is on the move everywhere. Mm -hmm. What do we do about it? Mm. Think very differently. To quote that Apple ad, you know the one with Einstein sticking his thing out? Think different. There's some movement in the world. Clever people, Chancellor Merkel, African leaders, President Buhari, are trying to rethink the phenomenon of what's happening in North Africa and into the Levant, in the Sahel, in the Maghreb. Because you see this phenomenon. You see three extremes. Extreme poverty, extreme climate, and extreme ideology. That unholy trinity is causing a lot of trouble. 
it might be very, very smart to gather around that problem before it um, explodes and before it bursts into flames, just to, just, to, just to be there to say to those people who are fighting to make a living in dirt, we're with you. Canada's got every country in the world here. If you can discern, and you have, that the right response is to understand the outside world and be at service of something bigger than yourself, then I think you're being true Canadian. I'm beginning to see why world leaders get convinced when they sit down with you. There is uh, the matter of the small the pill I put in your drink. Uh, so if you start to feel yourself going, yes. Well, I'd like to thank all of you for the. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. Thanks, Tom.